now.
Oh, glory. Glory to the Lord. You just don't know how good he's been. Woo. <laughs> You've been so good, Lord. You've been so good. Woo! You've been so good. You've been so good, Lord. <laughs> oh, somebody lift up your voice and praise him. <laughs> Jesus.
allowed for the time of rejoicing is near. Being allowed for the time of rejoicing the is near. The risen King, our groom, is soon to the appear. Behold 
His glory. And I say to you tonight, if you're in this place and you've said, Lord, I don't understand what they're saying when they're talking about your glory. I'm telling you, He's here tonight and His glory is in this place. I want you to do me a favor. Whatever church you're from or however you're used to worshiping, just for a few minutes, we're going to move on, sing, we will ride and shout some more. But let's stop right here. And I want to just introduce you to the Lord. Because he's here. <laughs> Woo! What you feel in your spirit right now, what you feel going on in this place, is the manifest presence of the Lord. He's here. Oh! The Lord is good. Come on, sing with me. The Lord is holy. The Lord is good. Behold His glory. The Lord is good. Yes, you are, Lord. The Lord is holy. The Lord is good. Behold his glory. Stand still and see the glory of the Lord. His righteousness is higher than the sun. Every king that rises up his head says, I am a mighty man. I will conquer thousands and I will subdue the nations. Oh, king, the Lord laughs at you. For who are you in the face of the Lord Almighty? one of Israel. Oh, children of the Lord, we don't serve a weak, pansy, wimpy God. We serve 
serve the Lord God, the creator of all things, the eternal one. people to rise and raise their voice against his work and his kingdom. All he has to do is just take back one beat of their heart and they are no more. Because he's great and he's mighty and he's bigger than anybody else. <laughs> has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. I hope I can sing this. <laughs> Come on, sing with me. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across this land. My heavens. But he's calling out to us. Are we honored or what? Lord, who are we that you want us to ride with you? Of course we will. <laughs> he has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. And he's riding the white horse across this land. And he's calling out to you and me. You ride. has a crown on his head and he carries a scepter in his hand and he's leading the armies all across this land he's calling out to you and me will you ride with me we say That fire in his eyes is his love for his bride, and he's longing that she be with him right by his side. That fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side. I could hear him calling out to you and me. You ride with me, and 
One time, you, come on. Give him a hand of praise. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God. God bless you. You may be seated. It's a mighty anointing in this room tonight as every night. Last night was one of the most awesome altar calls that I've ever been in my life. Something about this revival, you feel like you're accustomed to it, like you're flowing in that anointing, and you come back and you see things each week that just leave an indelible impression upon your life. And I tell you, God's doing something not just in Pensacola, but this revival is spreading across the nation and around the world. Hungry hearts. Hungry hearts. And this revival is about changed lives. How can anybody listen to these testimonies in the baptistry tonight and criticize what's going on? How many knows God is changing lives? I heard about the pseudo-intellectual who looked at the man of God whose life had been changed and said, if you can prove one scripture... I'll repent. This man of God reached out, grabbed him the end of the nose and began to twist until blood was spurting everywhere. He said, what are you doing? He said, Proverbs chapter 30, the Bible says, the churning of milk bringeth forth butter and the wring of one's nose bringeth forth blood. Now get down and repent right now. You reprobate. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. I don't understand critics. I really don't. The lives that are being changed here, God changed my life, my wife here a year and a half ago. Since that time, we've come down once a month just to lay in the presence of the Lord. And everywhere we go, we see lives changed. And uh, I never will forget that night, probably 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, when we put my wife in the wheelchair and rolled her out of here and went to Denny's. And uh, we discovered in Pensacola, in the restaurants, instead of smoking and non-smoking, there's praising and non-praising. How many knows what I'm saying? And you can spot your crowd immediately. You know where they're at. Glow on their face. Look like a swaddle light bulb. Smile as big as Texas. Now, I said that to say this, folks. It's awesome what's happening here. But get ready because soon there will not be a city in America where there will not be a church in the red-hot heat of Holy Ghost revival. My wife, quiet, reserved, bashful. One o'clock in the morning begins to laugh there at the table in Denny's. And I nudge her under the table to inform her that this is not church. We left Brownsville. This is Denny's. <laughs> Seemingly, it doesn't make any difference. She just don't care anymore. <laughs> A few minutes later, friends there, Sister Kilpatrick with us. She begins to laugh again. I said, Deb, would you be quiet? You see, I was embarrassed. Sister Kilpatrick knew it. She said, Preacher, you need some more carpet time. How many knows we all need that? Since that time, we've come down once a month. Since that day, we moved down here, and we just lay in the presence of the Lord. Tomorrow morning, we'll fly to St. Louis, Missouri, Collinville, Illinois. And every time we go out, it seems like there's a fresh anointing as a result of coming here to the fountainhead of this revival. But this revival, you'll see manifestations. Don't try to figure it out. I'm telling you, this revival is about changed lives. I remember when Pastor Kilpatrick looked at me in Missouri and I hadn't seen him in three years. Knew the revival was real because I knew his life. But he said, John, you need to come down. And I was so busy. We had a, a, a school of 35 students. 
and uh, trying to co-pastor Revival Center plus preaching meetings every month. And so I said, I'm going to get down as soon as I can. And again, he said, you need to come down. And I said, I'm coming down as soon as I can. And the third time he said, you need to come down, he said, I'm going to give you $5,000 for your school. The Holy Ghost said, go down. I heard him, folks. I mean, he spoke to me then. <laughs> I came down here to get that offering because we needed it at the school. That morning, I woke up and told my wife, we've got a $5,000 bill and debt that we need to pay. How many knows that God knows everything? And God spoke to him. And I came down here just to get that check. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. First night, second night, it was awesome. Getting ready to go back. Pastor said you need to stay one more night. Saturday night was the night. Why three nights? I don't know. Why it took four times people praying for me? I don't know. I don't have that figured out. All I'm telling you is never give up. Keep on pressing in because right over there on that floor laying on my back, God took junk out of me, changed me from head to heel, up and down, through and through, hat, pocket, book, and shoe, and I've never been the same, folks. And I'm going to tell you right now, hold your applause. Listen to this. This revival is about changed lives. Say it with me. Change. Say it again. You heard the testimonies from disgrace to his grace, from dope to hope, from the bottle to the Bible, from a tavern to a temple, from heartaches to hallelujahs, from a sinner to a winner. Ladies and gentlemen, from hell to heaven, from the guttermost to the uttermost, he took me out of the mire, put me in the choir. Amen. I'm justified. I'm sanctified. I'm Holy Ghostified. And I'm certified to be glorified. How many knows it's real? He will change your life. Well, hallelujah. And I tell you, last night when I saw Mike Brown stretched out here on this platform, he's as long as this platform. He went all the way from over here, and his head was over here somewhere. Sophisticated, educated, and yet so in love with Jesus Christ. And I told my son, my son's 21 years old. He's coming to school this year, Mike. He's coming down to school of ministry. And I'll tell you what, folks. I've spoken at some of the theological seminaries, some of the schools, but what's going on here at this church and at this school to me is the most awesome thing in the world. I spoke at a theological seminary years ago. A man raised his hand and said, how do you know when you're anointed? Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's a whole bunch of people out there that really don't know what it's all about. But in this school, in this church, it's more than just head knowledge. It's an experience that comes in our heart that changes our lives. And I wrote a poem called Education that goes something like this. Some go to college to learn. Their whole goal in life is to get smart. Their education exceeds their intelligence, a full head but an empty heart. They hear a professor who don't know the Lord explain how man came to be. Eons of years, a primordial ooze swam around in a vast mass sea. Then as chance would have it, that ooze turned to a tadpole, you see. The tadpole swam around, sprouted some legs, and Kermit the Frog came to be. Now the frog hopped around all over dry land, and one day it felt kind of funky. It grew a tail, jumped up, and said, I'm a teenage mutant ninja monkey. Now, hold on. It gets worse. The monkey swung his tail, broke. He fell on his head, walked, got up, walked into a downtown store, bought a suit and a briefcase, and said, I'm a man, and there's no God. Let me tell you how I came to be. I once was a monkey, but not anymore. I'm a professor with a Ph.D., now, there's a lot I don't know, but this one thing I do, let me tell you as well as explain. I come from God, and I belong to God, and my grandpa is not an orangutan. So study hard if you desire, but if you deny his shed blood, you'll learn Ph.D., M.D., and D.D. spell fud, mud, and dud. How many knows what I'm saying? Ladies and gentlemen, I believe in this revival, the most fertile soil in the world is the soil right here. I'm putting where my, my money where my mouth is. I'm sowing in this seed. I believe in Steve Hill. One night out of the week, he receives the offering. He can get it every night, but one night a week, he receives the offering for his ministry. And while we're having revival here, hundreds of thousands of dollars are going overseas to touch lives overseas. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the promise of God, the outpouring and then the appearing. How many knows he's coming in the clouds of glory? You love John Davis. <laughs> uh, well, stand up, everybody. Now y'all look good tonight. How many of you got rained on today? How many of you getting rained on tonight? 
Oh, come on, listen. How many of you stood in line today for over seven hours? How many of you stood in line for over 10 hours? How many of you stood in line for four? Join me on the platform tonight, Rodney Hart. <laughs> this man right here is a tremendous, tremendous preacher. Come on up, Brother Wilkerson. I've heard him preach on a number of occasions. I love to hear this man preach. He's a preacher of the gospel. God bless you, brother. Amen. It's good to have you with us tonight. I want you to uh, talk to us just a little bit. We're about to give this offering. I want Brother, you can be seated. I want Brother Wilkerson and Brother Hart to take just a moment tonight, and I want them to share what is happening and what Brother Hill and his ministry are giving to. Everybody look this way, please. Don't be distracted. This offering is so important, friends, because when we give these offerings to Brother Hill on Friday nights, this offering that he gets runs his ministry, which takes an amount of money to run his ministry, but the bulk of it, the majority of it, goes to missions. And one of the reasons Brother Hill is with us is because when he receives the offering on Friday night, it's abundant enough that he can stay here without having to get out and itinerate for missions works all over the world. Now, he could receive every offering that comes in. He could get... Wednesday night, or he could get Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday nights. But at his request, he said, no, just one offering a week. I appreciate that so much because the other offerings help our church to finance the revival, but also to uh, ex expand and to uh, finance our expansion efforts to accommodate the crowds that's coming from all over the world. But uh, tonight we have on the platform with us two men, and I'm going to have them share with us what's happening in their ministries, and Brother Hill is helping them. He's pouring a lot of money into their works. Brother Rodney Hart is a missionary, and he's starting the first Teen Challenge Center in prison ever. Did you hear what I said? The first Teen Challenge Center in prison ever. In prison. Brother Wilkes. Thank you very much, Pastor. And thank you, uh, Steve, for planting seeds into our ministry around the world. There are an estimated 55 million drug addicts around the world. 55 million drug addicts. And I think between Teen Challenge and the Brownsville Revival, there's going to be a few less th than that. <laughs> Amen. We are in about 55 nations now, and uh, the invitations continue to come from the nations of the world. I was just in Moscow a few, a few weeks ago, was in Moscow and sat with the bishop of the Pentecostal movement, and he said, please, please, we have been wanting for, for two years now, we've been asking for two years for your ministry to come here and to help us. As you may know, there, is always, there has been a long tradition of, of alcoholism in, in Russia, but now that they have freedoms, they have freedoms to sin in new ways. And now drugs has made its way into that nation as well. And the bishop said to me, he said, we don't know how much longer we have. We don't have long in our country, we see changes that are coming. We may not be able to have the freedoms that we have right now. Would you come? And I'm going to, would you pray? Our greatest need there right now, our greatest need is that God would raise up somebody with a call of God to go in there and to raise up a center in Moscow to, um, um, to penetrate that nation and to reach those that are addicted for two reasons. Not only to rescue those who are bound by drugs, but to be a living testimony to the society and to the government that democracy doesn't have an answer, communism does not have an answer, religion does not have an answer, Islam does not have an answer, Hinduism does not have an answer. The only answer is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And
And for nearly 40 years now, the Ministry of Teen Challenge has been demonstrating that the cross is still mightier than the switchblade. And it's only, it's only in a Christ-centered program. <laughs> Just let me tell you one cute little story. I, I love this story because uh, we have a, a lot of people have come to Teen Challenge and uh, have, have been sort of skeptical as to whether drug addicts can be cured or not. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, social workers, psychologists, and one of them came into our program one day and asked, uh, what is it about this ministry that's different? And he asked one of our young men, and I love his answer. He said, well, they give us God in the morning, Jesus in the afternoon, and the Holy Ghost at night. <laughs> now, that's the kind of program that's gonna change lives. And we are ministering around the world uh, another door that's open to us, uh, not long ago, I was in El Salvador by invitation of the president's wife, the first lady, entertained us for three days and said, please come and help us because we believe the only hope for our young people today is to have a program that's spiritually based. And so uh, we're looking in a few months, working together with Rodney Hart to go into El Salvador and raise up a program as there, uh, there as well. So Steve, thank you for investing in our program. We, we appreciate it very, very much. And uh, uh, Rodney, I love what's happening uh, in Paraguay. Um, as Pastor said, and Rodney will share it, you're gonna be able to open uh, the first Teen Challenge Center on a prison, federal prison ground. And uh, you're going to resentence the fellas to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I first want to say what a blessing it is to be here. And really the awesome presence of God in this place and how it's touched my life. And you know, I don't know if I'll even be able to get through two minutes as short as I'm going to try and be because I don't care anything about being in front of this pulpit or being in this church even though it's the greatest revival in the world. The greatest thing I care about and that has been made fresh to me today and these days was that 22 years ago when I was waking up in subway stations and there was no hope in this world for my life. When the psychiatrist had told my parents to go down, apply for permanent disability for your son because you'll never live a normal life again because the police committed me in a state hospital. And to know what death is on the inside. And then to hear the words of life, like you're hearing every night in this revival from a man that I met 20 years ago. See, I'm from Boston. I'm from the North. <laughs> and I'm from the programs from the Northeast. But I met a guy from the program from the South, from Huntsville, Alabama. And I met him at 3 o'clock in the morning because I was praying in one corner of a room and he was praying in another corner of the room. And I thought, oh my God, God is talking to me. but he's got a southern accent. <laughs> I want you to know something. I was fresh off the streets, but I had a heart for God because I knew he was real. And I met another guy that had a heart for God that knew he was real. And you know what? We prayed together after we prayed alone. And I remember dreaming dreams. I remember praying, Lord, raise us up. Raise us up, Lord. We don't care about anything else. Raise us up. And my heart's desire, Lord, make me a David to go back into the dungeon, go back into the pit to where I've, you've taken me from because nobody could do what you've done for me. And you know that today we were sitting together and, and I know that I've been blessed to be able to see the fulfillment of a destiny in the beginning because I've got a long way to go. And I thank God for the investment and you know, there was one time when Steve was in Argentina when he'd called me up and asked me for a little bit of help from our ministry and I'd just try and do something. But boy, I'll tell you what, when you cast the bread on the water, it can come back. And now Steve is, if it wasn't for Steve, I wouldn't be in Paraguay right now because of the money that he's invested 
in our ministry to touch lives. And I want you to know that when we went to Paraguay, there was no center in the country. Uh, the Lord spoke to me, go to the penitentiary, because if there's a drug addict in Paraguay, you'll find him there. And it's a captive audience. And I went there, and I went there every day, and I went there for seven months without seeing one convert. But then it happened. And I want you to know that in, inside of me, I knew that I knew that I knew. You see, I didn't go with any idea how it was going to happen, but I knew that God, I knew that the Lord, that the, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And He's upon me to preach the gospel to the captives. And, you know, I knew that guys were going to get set free. And then it happened, and God moved, and the first guys got set free. And they got to live in, in that prison. And then they came out, and they lived with us in our home, and the ministry continued to grow. And this was, this was several years ago. And the Lord put it in my heart four years ago that to ask and to get our own center inside the prison. Because, see, we were doing the ministry, but we were in one corner of the prison, in another corner of the prison. We were meeting together wherever we could. But the Lord put in my heart that we're going to have our own building so that we can reach other acts. Because you see, the guys that got saved and got delivered were set on fire. They got plugged in and we were having discipleship meetings. But there were a lot of other drug addicts in there that still said, man, that's crazy religion. That's not for me. But you see, this isn't like a United States prison. Now, when I went back after being in Teen Challenge for a year and I went back to my neighborhood and I was healthy looking. See, I got... Heft. I was only about 128 pounds, and when I went back to teen, went back to my neighborhood, I was a little bit uh, more than I am right now. So I was looking, they, and my friend said to me, "Man, I, nobody told me you went to jail, because in America, a drug addict goes to jail to get fat and get healthy. But in Paraguay, it's not like that, and I've got pictures to prove it, don't I, Brother Steve?" But you know, God put it in my heart four years ago to, to believe him for our own building inside the prison. And seven prison directors later, I want you to know something. Seven times when the Bible says to knock and knock and keep on knocking, you got to do it. Because I had out of the seven directors, four of them promised me buildings inside the prison. And I said, praise the Lord, this time it's going to happen. It come down to the, to the week or the month, and the next thing I knew, the whole change, you know, things happened real fast in Latin America, and that director was no longer a director anymore. And then, you know, the next guy that came in was a hard nose. He was a disciplinarian. There was one guy that got out of prison and was ministering back in the prison for two years. But he was, got out of prison on permission from one of those directors that liked us. He never went through the judicial process. He went back to the prison that day and went up to the new director and said, I'm here, I'm missing string every day for Teen Challenge. And he said, okay. The next day he went back to minister again and he never let him out again. He's back in prison right now. He's the intern director of the Teen Challenge ministry. We're gonna go get him out, but you know what? This is the same director that just three weeks ago, four weeks ago now, came up to me and said, had keys in his hand. I showed the pictures to Steve today and said, listen, this is yours. This is yours. And it's a building right there that we've been remodeling. And I'll tell you what, out of that place, the dreams and the lives of men that were the same, that maybe they're the same shape. I mean, you know, the problem of sin is the same around the world. But the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that came and entered into my life 22 years ago, that you know that you've been in the presence of God in this place in these days that, listen, it's real. And it's a privilege to be able to serve him in the country of Paraguay. And I'll tell you what, I thank the Lord for the ministry of Steve, for what he's doing for his heart because... He's never lost the first love. To me, he's the same guy I knew 22 years ago. But God has just used him in a tremendous way to channel the passion and the love that he has for Jesus to touch. And you know, the complicated, but I'll tell you what, 
the anointing of God. When God gets behind the words, it makes all the difference in the world. When God gets behind the words, it makes all the difference in the world. And this is a ministry that is changing lives. And in this night, in the, in the ministry of the Teen Challenge in Latin America, we're working together. Please stand together and believe God. And give with all of your heart tonight because you'll know that your investment is to change lives. Desperate lives. Desperate lives. That will never, be, that might not live. Our ministry is in between life and death, literally. And I thank you for your generosity and what you're going to do tonight for missions and for the ministry of Together in the Harvest. Amen. We're going to receive this offering. I want everybody in the chapel, all over this whole campus, choir room, cafeteria, wherever you may be, I want you to listen closely. You know, I've sat out there in the pews, and I've heard appeals for offerings, and they've turned me off as a preacher. You know, I've heard money raised for a lot of different things, and some of it I thought, dear God. And I know what it means to be turned off by somebody trying to raise an offering. But I also know by being in the ministry how important it is and what the needs are and to how people, listen, friends, to have government leaders asking Christians to come in and help their people, that's a miracle. Because they realize Jesus really is the answer. And the need tonight is, is huge. It's great. Here we are in this building. You may look around and say, boy, if everybody gives just a dollar, Lord, what an offering. If $50,000 comes in this offering tonight, I'm going to tell you that's just a proverbial drop in the bucket compared to the need. The needs are great. And I've often said this, friends, to my church down through the years, Brownsville, and I'll say it to you tonight, and I, I give you this. And I back it up in writing, God's holy word. If you'll just let it go, just let it go, God will give it back to you. If you'll just write it out, write your check out and let it go, God will give it back to you. But the needs are tremendous. And this offering tonight is basically a missions offering. This is the only one Brother Hill's ministry gets. It doesn't go in his pocket. It goes to help missions and it goes to run his ministry. So all over this campus tonight, would you help us? I'm going to ask the ushers to come. And I'm going to ask our football player to come up here and lead us in prayer. <clears throat> Catch him by surprise. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I saw, saw you a while ago with that shirt on, brother. Yes. That's the way I look when I wear a shirt like that. Amen. <laughs> You believe that? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Would you please reach for your wallets? Don't, don't depend tonight, friends, on somebody else to give this offering. We need everybody's help, everybody's participation. Now, as you're reaching for your wallet, your checkbook, everybody listen closely. There's no doubt in my mind, out of a crowd like this, that there's people here that's been blessed by God that you could do probably far beyond what other people in this building can do. Then there's people in this church building tonight. You really can't see that you can do anything. We understand that. and we, There's no pressure on anybody. If you can't do anything, friend, God bless you. We're happy you're here. This is without price. And your tithes does not belong in this offering. If you're here tonight and you're thinking about dropping your tithes in this offering to help in this missions offering, please don't do that. It's not principally right. It's not scripturally right. Take your tithes and put them in your church offering at home where you're fed by your pastor and your local church. This is an offering. You might really say it's alms and an offering because we're going to be helping the people that can't help themselves. <clears throat> let, me, let me share something else. Everybody look this way. This is a major revival. This revival is touching the world. It's absolutely touching the four corners of this world. And for an evangelist to only receive one offering whose ministry is touching the world, it's remarkable. 
So it needs to count. If you're here tonight and you can help us and you will help us, you may be a millionaire or you may be a blue-collar worker that only makes 8 to $10 an hour. But if God has blessed you and you have something to give, would you please share it with this ministry tonight and share it with people that can't help themselves? In just a moment, the offering plate is going to come by. And after it comes by, I'm going to have the ushers bring the offering bags back up here, and I'm going to bless this offering. I'm going to lay my hands on it and bless it. And I really feel like that some of you tonight need to sow in your famine, and you need to sow into this fertile soil where thousands and thousands and thousands of souls have been saved. So far, I think our marquee outside says 109,000 souls. Friend, this is fertile ground. And I'd like to encourage you to take your money, sow it in the soil, and I'm going to come back in just a moment. We're going to bless it after they receive the offering. They'll come back, pile them up here on the pulpit, and I'm going to lay my hands on it, and I'm going to bless your offering and ask God to take care of you and meet your needs. Why don't you lead us in prayer, son? Pray out of your heart. Amen? Amen. Pray right out of your heart. Hold the mic. Father in heaven, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord God, that we can get together, Lord God, to prepare to give an offering unto you, Lord God. Lord God, you send in your word, you love to cheer for giver, Lord God, and we have cheerful hearts here tonight. Lord God, we have families, Lord God. We're not going to be concerned about our bills, and Lord God, we ever made a sacrifice, Lord God, we're going to make one tonight to you. Lord God, bless those who have to give, Lord God, bless those who have not to give. Lord God, take these funds, Lord God, we're going to utilize them to your kingdom, Lord God, so that your kingdom may be advanced. Lord God, just look down upon each heart here tonight, Lord God, and speak to us in a mighty way. And Father, just remind us, Lord God, that you shall supply all our needs through your riches and glory in heaven. Lord God, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praises and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. ushers will be bringing up the offerings in a moment. I just want to speak to you very briefly. We're always blessed when the folks get baptized here in our services from New Hope Homes. They've been working together with the revival, had a strong ministry before, and had brought many of the people in New Hope Homes on a regular basis into the revival, and they've been touched in the revival and saved in the revival, and we just rejoice to work together. But something that we commonly hear when they get baptized, they'll often address the devil and say, Satan, hands off. I'm God's property. Or tonight, you know, I'm joining the battlefield. I'm in God's army. See, there's an understanding that God saved them for a purpose, and that God got them off drugs and delivered them from alcohol and a wasted life for a purpose. 
But friends, it's the same for each and every one of us. We've been saved for a purpose. We've been redeemed by God for a purpose. It's not just to have an education. It's not just to have a nice family. It's not just to have a nice home. It's so that we can do the will of God and glorify Him here. And people are waking up in the midst of the revival, not just people who are on the street or on drugs or messed up. People are waking up to the fact that God has a purpose for their lives. And I was praying today. We, we were having our day session and it's thunder and lightning, and I just made reference to a sermon that Whitfield preached in the thunder and lightning, and suddenly poof, the thunder and lightning hit, and the power went out, and we had a session without natural power, only spiritual power. Hungry hearts seeking the Lord together. But when I was praying, we were all seeking God just for the, the deepest thing burning in hearts. And I thought, what is it? What's the deepest cry in my heart? And I just said, God, I want to be totally consumed by you. I want to move into a whole other place in you. I want to know you in a way I've never known you. And I want you to dominate my life in a way I've never been dominated by you. And I want to bear fruit for you like I never have before. And I believe that's the heart cry of many here. Tomorrow, I believe, at our 11 o'clock session, I want to take up that theme. If you can come, if you're still in town, don't worry about the lines because you can come to the session and then go back out and get on a line. There'll still be a line there. You can be in the session and be online too. But I tell you, in all seriousness, I believe God wants to speak to us and challenge us. These are awesome days. Whenever we speak to media, they're asking us about the historical background. This is a once in a century happening, friends. And as God continues to move, what he's doing around the world is a one time in history happening, the worldwide moving of God that's taking place. Long before Brownsville, the fire fought, fell here, God's been moving around the world. And I want to encourage you, friends, not to let this opportunity go by. So we'll be meeting here tomorrow at 11 o'clock talking about a God-consumed life. I believe God will speak to you and challenge you. Let me also encourage many of you that have come here with all different ideas and motivations and reasons that God might have other plans for your life. We've raised up a school of ministry not because we had nothing else to do, not because we had too much leisure time, but because God made it plain that we needed to raise up laborers with the fire of revival and help send them out to the ends of the earth. And the Lord may have a more radical change in plans than any of you have ever dreamt of. What you just say is, Lord, whatever you want, whatever the consequences, whatever the cost, I'm here to do your will. That's the beginning of it. That's the end of it. You want to stand before him so he can be well pleased with you. So we'll be meeting here tomorrow at 11. Final ushers are coming forward with the offerings. We're meeting here at 11. Grab one of the brochures about the school of ministry. And just say this last thing. In Luke 9, Jesus sends out his disciples. But first he's talking to them and calling them to pray. And he says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will thrust forth laborers into his harvest. And people love to pray that prayer. Oh, Lord, thrust forth laborers into your harvest. Jesus, we really feel the burden. And you know what he says, his next words? Go, I'm sending you. He may be saying that to many here. He's certainly saying it to every one of us in one way or another. So it's one thing to pray, Lord, send out laborers. But you may hear him say, go, I'm sending you. Amen. Pastor. Would you stand, please? Extend your hands this way. In all the buildings, if you will, just extend your hands toward the screens. We're going to bless these offerings. Now, Lord, we really don't know what's in these offering bags. We know that there's not tithes in here. This is offerings. And, Lord, we don't know how much is in here. But you know what the needs are and what the demands are on Together in the Harvest. And so, Father, I bless these offerings, these offering bags now. We speak increase that whatever is in here, that it more than meet the needs and the demands. And, Father, I bless these offerings because these bills... This currency, these checks represent hours the people have worked and they have actually given hours of their lives in these offering bags. And they did it, Jesus, because they love you and your work. You said, Peter, can I borrow your boat? And you launched out just a little ways and spoke to the people on the shore. 
And then after you got finished, you said to Peter, launch out. And he caught so many fish, it sank two boats. Son, can I borrow your lunch? You break it, fed 5,000, and he had 12 baskets left over. That was their offering. Now, Lord, these people here tonight have given equally. And, Lord, you're so tender and so sweet. When you see the giving of your people, even those that really has to sacrifice to do it, you will not let that go unnoticed. And so, Jesus, I bless this now, and I speak that this offering come back on them many times, especially when they need it. And, Lord, I pray that you'll keep their appliances, their cars, and their houses in good repair. I ask you, Lord, to bless them going out, coming in. Make them the head, not the tail. Bless them in the city and bless them in the country. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the churches that are represented here and pour out the fire of revival in the name of Jesus. Amen. name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, 
is upon us because he has anointed us to preach good news. The spirit of the sovereign God is upon us because he has anointed us to preach good news. He has sent us to the poor. Find of the broken hearted to bring freedom to the captives and to release the ones in darkness. everyone just to pause for a minute whether you're a God hater or a God lover in this place I want you to just thank God that you're alive that you're breathing when I listen to this brother from the Crimson Tide Alabama University University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa testify how he was spared from that car wreck other folks died don't ever take your life for granted friend don't ever do that Jesus I just want to thank you that you allowed me to wake up today. 
Thank you, Jesus, that you gave me breath today. Thank you, Jesus, that you've allowed me to breathe one more day, Lord. I don't take that day for granted. Thank you, Lord. I bless you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. You need to learn how to live like that, friend. And thanksgiving. I want everyone to stand in the other buildings. I know our campus is totally packed tonight, and it makes no difference where you're at. On this campus, God is here. He sees your heart. And I want to tell you, I've learned something, friend. Attitude has a whole lot to do with it. If you're, if, you're, um, if you're upset because you didn't get the seat you wanted, you can lose God's presence in your life tonight. Just, just driving them around because you're pouting. You're pouting. And you just, this is not about pouting, and it's not about the seat you wanted. It's about God. It's about the Lord. I met a girl one night in the back hallway, was sitting in a seat underneath a speaker in the hallway. And I, and I said, how you doing? She said, fine. And I said, you enjoy the revival? She said, yeah. And I said, uh, I said how many times have you been here? She said, this is my first time. And uh, I said, it's your first time here? She said, yeah, and I got a seat <laughs> in the hallway underneath a speaker. And she was as happy. She went through the whole service without seeing it. No screen. And after that, we started putting the revival on the walls. We, we've done everything we can, friend. Trust me in this. But this girl had such a good attitude, friend. I can't even see it, but I'm here. God's with me. So, friend, thank God that you're in this place, that you're on this campus. He's going to touch you. I want to say something to those of you, before you're seated, before we pray together, I want to say something about those of you that are just ed up inside over all this stuff that's going on in this revival. Those unusual baptisms. Those are. I want to tell you, I've, I've, I've only been saved 22 years, and that's not a long time, but I've seen some baptisms. I ain't never in my born days seen anything like this, friend. They're just different, aren't they? And uh, I love them. I love them because God's changing lives. I don't care if people fall, shake, jerk, jump up and down, pogo stick. It doesn't matter to me anymore, friend, because lives are changing so fast. It's awesome. But, you know, every now and then, the, it, for example, the other night, uh, CNN was here, and they stayed over on a Friday night, and I thought, I was sitting over there, and I said, Jesus, you know CNN's here tonight. It's Friday night, and you know, it's like the night that you invite your mother, you know, to service, and she's a Episcopalian, <laughs> and I love Episcopalians. We got a lot, of, we got them working on our prayer team, but they're, you know, my mom is a Lutheran, you know, and just more laid back and worship and all that. You invite her to a service. You want things to be more calm, you know, more Lutheranish. And I said, uh, I said, Lord, CNN's here tonight. You know, if we could just have one of those calm baptisms, you know, because they got their cameras up there and they're filming this Jesus, and you know they're going to put it around the world. And if you could just, you know, a few of the folks that are just says they say. I was away from God and Jesus has come into my life and I want to, I want to be baptized because of his commands. <laughs> and everyone goes, and then they walk up on their own, you know. <laughs> no, friend. No. No. Uh-uh. That night, that was a couple weeks ago, the most violent baptism was I'd ever, from the very beginning, water went everywhere, went all over the CNN, just everywhere. And after the first couple of them, you know, because almost every single one of them were violently hit by the power. And after a couple of them, I turned to the pastor and I went, oh, well, you know. There goes our coverage, you know. But you know, God, He knows what this world needs. 
This world does not need another religious service. They don't need any more stale religion. And the more, it's almost like the more violent God comes down. It's like the youth that come here by the thousands from all over the world. They see this stuff, they go, dear God, he must be alive. Look at that. So we say, welcome, Jesus. Have your way. But but I'd like to say something to you. This was written by Andrew Murray years ago. This is for those of you that do not like the outward, you know, the, the exuberant praise. I want you to look this way. That's okay. Okay? There's people that will be prayed for tonight and the power of God will sweep over them and they won't be able to get up off the floor for hours. They'll shake violently. They'll go to Shoney's and they'll try to get something off the salad bar and they'll be shaking it. <laughs> Friend. And then, and you'll get prayer. You'll get prayer and you won't feel a thing. But God still touched you. Listen to this. I want you to listen to this because this is our stand in this revival concerning emotion. There are some Christians, this was written 100 years ago, there are some Christians who are not content unless they have special mighty visitations of the Spirit. The rushing mighty wind, floods outpoured, and the baptism of fire, these are their symbols. There are others to whom the fountain springing up from within and quietly streaming forth appears to be their genuine response to the Spirit's work. Do you see the two there? One is just violent. They want the fire. They want the rushing mighty wind. And others, they want it to quietly stream forth from within, a fountain springing up from within. Inside. They love the peacefulness. We should recognize God in both and hold ourselves always ready to be blessed in whichever way God chooses to come. Well spoken. I like that. So we're not here, we're not promoting emotionalism. If you don't clap, that's fine. If you don't jump up and down, that's fine. A person that jumps up and down next to you is not more spiritual than you are. It's just their, their form of worship. And it's time for all of us to be free in the way we worship. I want everyone to pray. There are some people here tonight. I know I could give an altar call right now, and I have half a mind to do that because there's some people here right now. You're on the edge. You're on the edge of eternity. You're ready to get saved. You want to get the sin out of your life. There are other people in this room that don't want to be here. You don't want to be on campus. You're in the chapel. You're in the choir room, the cafeteria. Somebody drug you in this place, and you can't wait to get out of here. This is weird. This is strange. This is odd. This is, you might even be, go so far as to think this is new age or something because you've never been around anything like this. Friend, I want to tell you something. This is good for you. God has taken you out of your lifestyle and brought you among people. And you're one of 1.7 million people that have come through here. From, they're here tonight from about 50 nations of the world. And they brought, God has brought you here. God has brought you here because he wants you to experience him. And some of you are so dry and so thirsty and so dead in sin that you get around this exuberance and it doesn't make any sense to you. You could go to a Florida State game or a Crimson Tide game and you'll go wild because that's your life. You come in here and you can't under, you're looking around and you're going, what are they going wild over? There's no rock and roll band. There's no triple X rated movie on the screen. What, what's everybody going wild? We have tapped in to our creator. He's the one that put us here. That's what it's all about, friend. And God has brought you here. He has brought you here. Well, everyone pray with me right now. Everyone out loud, those of you that don't know the Lord, I want you to pray. And those of you that do know the Lord, I want you to pray. Out loud, everyone. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your In your precious name. Amen.
You may be seated. Just a few minutes, in just a few minutes, Charity is going to come and sing Run to the Mercy Seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. For those of you that are not familiar with my testimony, it's a lot like Rodney Hart's who shared with you a minute ago. On October 28, 1975, I want everyone to listen. No commotion. Don't let anyone distract you. If someone turned to you and wants to know where we're going to go eat this after the service, there are only a few choices. <laughs> you have. And if I name your restaurant, Bubba, you better tithe to us. You have the Waffle House. You have Crystal Burgers. You have, I'm going to say this, Shoney's, but I want to tell you something right now. It's high time you gave financially to this offering. Shoney's down the road does well. Show me a Shoney's anywhere in the world where people line up at 1.30 in the morning to get in. And they don't even have to mix their salad in the salad bar. People just come and they're, they're hit by the power. Salad just goes everywhere. <laughs> Rodney. Some of you are laughing because you've been there. Rodney Hart, a friend of mine that just shared from Paraguay, he went there last night, could not believe it. People were being hit by the power all over Shoney's, and the waitress is just walking around like nothing's going on. And it's true, the restaurants all over this city, I mean, this has been going on two years, friend, they are accustomed to the revival. They know what's going on. Then you have, um, what a burger? Hey, I'll have you know, that is John Kilpatrick's favorite place. So you only have a few choices. So quit talking about it, and you can make up your mind if you can drive there after the revival. But my life was supernaturally transformed by the power of God during an encounter with Him at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning back in October of 1975. I'm being very specific. This transformation was so obvious that my own mother, who had watched me spiral into the cesspool of alcoholism and drugs, had seen me go from an adolescent child to a hardened criminal, had seen me evolve from a loving son to a hateful man, in a matter of seconds, saw my countenance change from being rock hard, weather beaten by living years in sin, into that of an innocent young boy. My mom comes to this revival all the times, and she said she had never seen anything like it in her life. I was saved in 30 seconds. She testified here how she looked into my eyes after my conversion and saw a totally different person. I'm talking about after 30 seconds. We believe in this revival, in a living God, and we believe that man, mortal man, can have an encounter with him. See, religion, friend, is not an encounter with God. Religion is man's attempt to get to him. You travel this nation, travel the world, you'll see spirals up into the heavens with crosses on top. Stained glass windows. You'll walk in and there. I've been around this world, friend. I've seen sanctuaries that have blown me off. The, you, take, you take tours of the sanctuaries because every square inch of them, there's mosaics and intricate artwork and the finest material went in. That's all man. Oh, man, and some of it was well-intentioned, friend, but it was always man trying to please God, trying to get up there. See, Christianity, friend, is God coming down to man. 
For God so loved the world that he came. He gave his only begotten son. Religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. There's a big difference, friend. Religion in America has damned us, friend. This Sunday, day after tomorrow, our churches will be full of people that tithe their time to God. I'm talking about a small tithe. They give a little percent of their time to God. I'll go do two, year, two days in, or two hours in church. It's like doing time in the penitentiary. They'll go do time, and, and they'll go, they, before they leave out, they'll set the roast because they know they're going to do two hours in church. And they sit in church. Pastors, you know what I'm talking about. They will sit there with their watches out. And if you don't start preaching on time, then somebody's going to be upset because they know you're going to go 10 minutes too long. And if you go 10 minutes too long, don't you dare give an altar call. And if you do, I ain't hanging around to see it because I'm going home to eat and watch a ball game. That's religion, friend. That is religion. You go in the same way, you go in one way and you leave out the same way, friend. I'm tired of that. America is tired of that. America wants a living God and an encounter with Him. Well, I want you to know I am not tired tonight. My conversion 22 years ago was the genuine article. I had been saved by crying out to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the healer of our bodies, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Alpha and Omega, the Holy One of Israel. I cried out that morning to the one whose name the devils hear and tremble. For those of you that have not heard the story, this Lutheran minister came into my room and he took a hold of my hand and I'd been on drugs for years, 12 years. I was a mainliner, just always pumping poison into my body, in my veins, in my mouth, drinking, habitually uh, drugged out constantly. And this minister, Lutheran minister, came over to my house, a young man, and he grabbed a hold of my hand. He said, Steve, I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. He said, and he said, Steve, his name is Jesus, and he's in this room. And I said, I don't believe in God. And he said, that's okay. He's here anyhow. <laughs> then he said, then he said, pray with me. And I said, I don't know how to pray. And he said, that's okay. You don't have to pray. Just say the name Jesus. What faith. What faith. He didn't say, Steve, my, my. I've got a track here. It's called The Four Spiritual Laws. We need to get down to the nitty-gritty. It's obvious you don't have a full understanding of who he is and who you are. No, friend. He said, Steve, I tell you what, you don't even have to pray. Just say the name Jesus. Whew. Well, I want to tell you, friend, I did that. I began to say softly on my bed, years of drug addiction, Addicted at that time, wasted, my life was in shambles. And I remember looking up at the ceiling. I was lying on my bed. I'd been going through convulsions for three days. It was demonic warfare on my body, friend. It was horrific. I mean, it was horrible. For three solid days, my body had been shaking. I'd been going through hot and cold sweats. I thought I was going to die. And I remember looking up at the ceiling, and I said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And my Lutheran mama was outside the bedroom listening. She had been praying for me for years. She had never heard me use that name in the right way. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the more I said his name, something started coming all over me. And I began to say it louder when I began to feel it. I went, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And the power of the living God swept through my body and changed me. Totally. Totally. Whoa. Well, friend. I want to explain what happened to you. There's only one name that the devil trembles over. 
You can cry out. Tonight, you can go, Devil, in the name of Brownsville Assembly of God. Friend, he's sleeping. You can say, in the name of the Pensacola Revival. Forget it, friend. You're wasting your breath. I'll go one step further. I got something here tonight. You can say, Devil, you know what I have in my hands? I have the church directory <laughs> and the official list of ministers and missionaries of the General Council of the Assemblies of God. Read it and weep, Lucifer. <laughs> you can walk up to him, friend, and go, I'll have you know, devil, you're dealing with the revival that was in the front page of the New York Times. He's going, whoop-dee-doo. He said, I've been on the front page of the New York Times ever since it came out, the devil's saying. <laughs> you ain't getting through to him, friend. You can look at the devil. You can put a sneer. Have you ever seen people casting out demons? They go, devil. That doesn't help any friend. You, I can see him in hell going, oh my. Look at that face. You can look at the devil. You can put a sneer, snotty expression on your face. You can grab your list of denominations. And you can say, devil, here they are. Every church in America. He's doing the same thing you're doing, friend. He's laughing. You would laugh if you read this. It'll say First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, the First Division of the Second Baptist Church. I mean, it is amazing what's on this list, friend. And they're actually denominations of just break-offs and split-offs and whoo, that ha you haven't impressed him yet, friend. Whoo, I'm coming. You can say, I come to you in the authority of the corporate church, devil. You can say, matter of fact, you can start shouting evangelist's name. You can say, devil, I come to you in the name of Jack Hayford. <laughs> Demons of hell. Billy Graham, <laughs> Stephen Curtis Chapman, <laughs> DC Talk, <laughs> listen Lucifer, <laughs> look into my face, John Hagee, boo! You can say in the name of Stephen Hill, in the name of John Kilpatrick, in the name of Lyndall Cooley, friend, ain't nothing gonna happen. But something, something, oh, something, woo, something. Something begins to happen! Woo! Woo! Glory! Sit down, I'm not finished. Something begins to rumble in the corridors of hell. When you mention another name, the walls quake and the demons shake when you say that name. It's not a long name like John D. Rockefeller or Orville Redenbacher. As a matter of fact, it's quite short, only five letters. And those letters don't really carry a lot of weight when mentioned alone. 
Even the first letter J is so common and unconvicting. We've heard names like Jim, James, Jonathan, Jeffrey, Jason, and Jack, Judy, Jill, Jennifer. These names, the mention of these names don't cause the least bit of worry to the dark underworld. Those names won't even register on hell's Richter scale. But friend, there is a name. The other night, we had some warlocks and witches in the back, you know, and they were chanting there. They were going, and they, they had their little bracelets, you know, going, friend, that might work somewhere. You're wasting your time in this place. You are wasting your time in this place. And I want to tell you why. There is a name above all names. If you don't believe that, next time you're in your seance, next time you got the candles down, the, the lights down low and the candles are burned, the incenses fill the room, and you're all holding hands and you're chanting, you bring up the name I'm about to talk about. <laughs> Woo, you're going to have war in that room. There's a name above all names. A name, when you begin to articulate it, it starts a chain reaction of fear throughout the kingdom of darkness like a flash flood. It sends. It sends the needle to the far right. It causes hell's Richter scale to peek out and fall from the table. It causes the devil's ears to point upward and his tail to stick straight out. And if he could turn red, he would. It's what happens when you put J-E-S-U-S -S together. His name is Jesus, and there's only one name under heaven whereby you must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Woo! He's in this room. Glory. Glory. One name. One name. One name. One name. Woo! Jesus, 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 Jesus. Well, you bunch of fanatics, you may be seated. Friend, I want to tell you something. If you call yourself a Christian and you can't get excited about that name, there's something wrong with you, friend. I'm going to tell you something else. If you can go in a restaurant and you order your meal and they bring you that food and you're embarrassed to bow your head, I question whether you know him. I question whether you know him, friend. Because anyone who knows the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords knows that that steak, that potato, that corn on a cob, that salad, the ingredients that made that Coca-Cola 
Everything that you're about to consume was provided by him. He has given you this daily. He's daily, your daily bread. And friend, for you to sit there in embarrassment because of what people might think. I question tonight. You can get upset at me if you want. I question your relationship with Jesus. Boy, you can worship in church. You can lift your hands and praise around godly people. But boy, in the, in, the, in, the, in the presence of the ungodly, you're embarrassed. I challenge everyone in this room. In those restaurants where you go, don't even hesitate to take your hands, the hands of your family. Set them right on the table, man. And go, Jesus. And you don't have to be obnoxious about it, friend, but I'm talking about praying. Let the whole place see that you believe in Jesus. And I tell you what will happen. Half the place will fall under, fall under conviction. Because 84% of North American adults believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 84%. 80% of North American adults believe they will stand before God on Judgment Day and be held accountable for their sins. So when you're sitting there praying, you're reminding them there's a judgment to come. They already, most of them already know that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And here you got the guts to sit in a restaurant and pray and say, thank you, Jesus, for this food. And don't try this number, friend, of just sort of looking at your food. And when you look at your food, you go, Jesus, thank you for this food. <laughs> what was that? What was that? He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. If you'll confess me, I'll confess you. You're ashamed of him, friend? He's ashamed of you. I can see heaven just turning from you. What an embarrassment. Brother, God's moving in this place. I can tell right now. Some of you are in serious, serious shape. I want to pray right now to Jesus. I've closed my Bible. And I've closed my notebook. The Lord told me tonight at 6.05 when I was heading out the door to come to the revival. No, it's 5.05. He said, Steve, I'm going to move in that place tonight. And see, we don't live with all this preconceived ideas. Every day when we come into this revival, friend, it scares me half to death. I crawl in this place, spiritually speaking. I come in here, I go, God, would it be possible for you to move one more time? Would you so choose, Jesus, to visit us on Mobile Highway? One more time. Would it be possible, Jesus, that you could anoint our prayer team one more night? Could it be possible, Jesus, that another drug addict could be saved tonight, Jesus? And would you deliver the man from adultery, Jesus? Would you set those in pornography free, Lord? Would you set free those that are captive with alcoholism, Jesus? Would you do that one more time? That's the way we come every single night to this revival, friend. There's not an arrogant bone in my body. We're all nothing. We're dirt. We're all dirt. For anybody in this room to think you're somebody is an abomination in the eyes of God. Woman, I want to tell you something. If you're pretty and the world looks at you as a beautiful girl, you need to bow down before Jesus every day of your life and say, Jesus, you gave me my ears, you gave me my eyes. You placed the nose on my face, you put the tongue in my mouth. Lord, I could have been born any other way, but you allowed me to be born what the world calls pretty. Which is a false pretty, by the way. Yes, 
but the world looks at me as being pretty. They think I'm pretty. You need to get on your face, child. They say, Jesus, I'm dirt. And you chose to put this dirt together to where man would look upon me and say, you're a beautiful girl. We want you to be a model. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. Jesus, I just want to tell you that I know every bone in my body, every movement of my muscles, every time I point my finger, every time I look into the camera and smile, it's all you. You're the one that causes my muscles to move. You're the one that causes my eyes to see. You're the one, Jesus. And friend, I want to tell you, you better start living like that. Because God resists the proud, the arrogant. I got a picture the other day, I was on a flight and I looked in this magazine and there was a picture of a woman being analyzed by some doctors and they discovered that one of her ears, she was a model, one of her ears was 1 16th of an inch longer than the other one. And she was having surgery to correct that deformity. It's called, dear God, man, deformity. I'm going to speak to you from my heart before charity comes. There's people in this room that are under conviction. Look at me, everyone, and those of you in the chapel and the choir room and the cafeteria. You are under conviction. Conviction has to do with guilt. That's why they call prisoners in, in the jails convicts, because they have been found guilty of a crime. Convicts. Some of you are sitting in this room and you hear these testimonies or you hear the worship and you feel funny inside. Your heart begins to beat like this. The preacher talks about you being embarrassed to pray around a dinner table in a restaurant and your heart goes. Many of you, when I talk like that, your heads drop right in front of me. I saw your heads drop. You fell under conviction. You went, dear God, man, that was the arrow of the Lord piercing your heart. You're ashamed of him in public. You're ashamed of him in public. That's conviction. Sis, sir, you need to thank God for conviction. There's all kinds of words for it in the Bible. There's a word in the scriptures called prick. They were pricked in their hearts when they heard the gospel preached. It's the same thing as conviction. What must we do? Last night in this revival service, I spoke on the man at the pool of Bethesda. And when Jesus said to him he was sick for 38 years, Jesus turned to him and said, Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing befalls you. And I began reading that yesterday morning. And how many people have I seen that did not heed the Lord's words? They did not go. They received a miracle from Jesus, but they did not go and sin no more. They fell back into sin. And a worse thing befell them. The man slipped back into alcoholism. I used this illustration last night. Everything was okay beforehand. He, he quit alcoholism, quit drinking, was clean for a couple years, but he started drinking again, and one day he's going home from work, and he swerves off the road, and he hits another oncoming car, and three children are killed instantly. This, happened, this will happen tonight all over America. And suddenly this man, chances are he's a churchgoer. In America, chances are... There's a good chance he's a churchgoer. But here he is. Suddenly, a man, a married man, who just had to go to the bar for their happy hour. Here he's standing in the county jail with a chain around his neck and a plaque and his name on the plaque, and he's got a number. And he's fixed in the face, 25, 30 years in the penitentiary. Something worse came upon him. Jesus warned that man. 38 years in sickness. And he said, you better stop sinning, Bubba.
don't ever sin again or something worse will come upon you. And when I shared that last night, friend, I walked through the crowd and conviction was on hundreds of faces. People turned from me like that. Others dropped their head because something worse had already come upon them. Their sin was creeping up on them. And the, the, the results of sowing those seeds of sin were, were, were bringing in a harvest of weeds, wild weeds and thorns and thistles, and their life was being destroyed. Talk to any alcoholic. Talk to any adulterer that just can't stay from, away from other women and look at their life. Go to their home. Look at the hell on earth at home. Look at the nightmare life that they live when they're, when they're out and about wondering who's watching them. Paranoia all around them. A worse thing comes upon them. Then it happens. They're sitting in a restaurant with their, their little lady in another city. They have their rendezvous in another place with this lady because they live in Pensacola, but now they're in Mobile having a date with this lady. And it just so happens that their daughter is in Mobile too, going to a ball game. And she drives up to that restaurant just to go in and get a hamburger. And she looks over there and sees her dad with another woman. And suddenly the man sees his daughter and that scripture comes alive. Something worse befalls me. His life comes crushing down on him. His family is split apart. His daughter hates him for eternity. We'll never trust him again. She walks over to him in the restaurant and says, Who are you? You a betrayer. I don't ever want to see you again, Dad. As a matter of fact, I promise I will never use that name again with you. You don't have a part in my life. This happens all over America. It will happen tonight all over America. And last night when we were sharing these stories, people fell under conviction. Your heart starts to beat like this. You know something's wrong. You know something's wrong with your life. Friend, when I mentioned things like watching pornography on the television, watching someone take their clothes off on television, and you can sit there and watch that, I'm telling you tonight, you're in sin. Jesus would never do that. And sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, not to participate in it, not to promote the sin of the world. He was nailed, beaten, whipped, spat upon, cursed at, so you wouldn't be in bed with another woman, sir. So you wouldn't be down at Jack's bar soaking your liver with poison. That's why he died, to take away the sin of the world, to destroy the works of the devil. Some of you right now, you're under that conviction. You feel it. Tonight, you need to thank God for conviction. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to feel that. You know what that is? That's a sign that he's still here. It's a wonderful sign that he still cares. The scary part is when you don't feel it. And you go, hey, whoa, what's everybody all concerned about? Friend, you are an alligator infested waters. A remarkable thing happens in this revival every night. I've seen some stuff in my life. But I've never seen such deliverance. I've never seen, friends, such miracles spiritually. And sure, we've had healings, and I love physical healings. But I want to tell you honestly, I got added up to here in Argentina with physical healings. I lived in Argentina for seven years. Physical healings were just, just like bread and butter everywhere all the time. And I learned something about physical healings. They won't change you. They won't change you. You think they'll change you? You think you see somebody jump out of a wheelchair and run across the stage will change you? Forget it, sis. You'll have goosebumps for a few hours. They'll go away. 
You can see a man raised from the dead. You'll forget about him after a while. So I get, you know, I love the physical healing. We believe in God every night for miracles. We see miracles here. A lady testified the other night of cancer, being delivered from cancer. It's awesome. But the most miraculous thing we see is when someone is sitting in the back or sitting in the chapel, sitting in the choir room, the cafeteria, up in the balcony, and they're buckled over because of conviction. And they're going, Jesus, I nailed you to that tree. I'm the one that keeps driving the nails in deeper. I'm the one throwing that whip across your back. I'm the one raking it down to your buttocks. I'm the one ripping your flesh to shreds, Jesus. Every time I put the cigarette in my mouth, every time I curse your name, every time I open that magazine, every time I watch that program, I beat you, I whip you, Jesus. I'm so sorry. It's heaven sent, friend. It's wonderful. It is wonderful, friend, to feel that. God loves you. He cares about you. I was going to speak tonight on Philip and Nathaniel, and I may speak tomorrow night. I don't know. But how Philip went to Nathaniel and said, we've met him. The Messiah. Nathaniel had his doubts. And some of you in this room right here have been brought here by a friend. I want everyone to listen. A friend has brought you here. And they said to you, you've got to go to this revival. You've got to go to this revival. You've got to hear it. You've got to feel it. You've got to sense it for yourself. You've got to experience what God is doing here. By the grace of God, friend, and that's all it is, you made it here. God got you here. And you're sitting in these pews. You're sitting in the chapel. You're sitting in the choir room. You're sitting in the cafeteria. Or you're sitting at home watching this. And the Spirit of the Lord is gripping your heart. And you realize that you are so far from God, it's scary. He's brought you here, friend. He's brought you here. beauty of the story with Nathaniel and Philip is that Nathaniel closed that gap. He met the Lord. And friend, that's what you're going to have to do tonight. You can sit in your pew. You can sit in your chair. You can sit at home in your lazy boy. Ain't nothing going to happen. But once you hear about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he will forgive you. He'll wash your sins away. You're going to have to close that gap. See, he's already done his part. Are you listening? He's done his part, friend. Jesus doesn't have to do one licking thing for you. Not one more thing, friend. For those of you that are saying, and, and when people say this to me on the streets when I'm evangelizing, I do everything but slap them. When they say, if God is real, then he'll prove himself to me. I go, whoa, 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 Bubba. Breathe. Do that again. Do that again. Do that again. There he is. Right there. Proof positive. Proof positive. And I'll begin to explain just for a minute that if there was just a minor change in the atmospheric conditions, you would drop dead right here. But no, God's got a balance. Perfect balance. So we who call ourselves human beings can walk and talk, and make money, and live, and surf, and fly around, and just have fun. Perfect balance. And all God would have to do is just change the atmospheric conditions just a little bit. Little bit. And we'd go, ah, 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 ah. Every one of us, in a second. But no, he keeps the sun where it's at, the clouds where they're at, the oceans where they're at, you ever notice that? Whoosh. Whoosh. Isn't that something? I've traveled the oceans, friend. They just stop. They stop, friend. And then 50 feet beyond that, you can build a house. Why? That's where the oceans stop. Whoosh. What a God. 
What a God. Don't you tell me he's got to do anything more for you, friend. He doesn't have to do one more thing for you. It's time for you to do something about what he's already done for you. It's time for you to make a decision tonight to not only hang around the cross and go, wow, what a message. Wow, what a revival. I'm going to start going to church. No, friend, that's not what you need to do. I'm going to join the choir. No, friend. I'm going to go down to J.C. Penney because they're having a 75% off gold jewelry sale. And I'm going to buy me a cross. Now that I've had a spiritual experience, no, friend, what you're going to do in about five minutes is get up from where you're at and you're going to get the sin out of your life and you're going to bring a smile on the face of the Lord. And some of you, for the very first time in your life, you're going to turn the Lord's frown to a smile. He's going to look at you and go, I want everyone to stand. Some of you are sitting here and you're going, I can't believe that. He talked to us for 45 minutes and didn't even quote one scripture at the beginning of the message. He's supposed to quote a scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There. Please move your chairs to the left and the right. Thank you for waiting for me. You wouldn't believe people, friend, that come to the revival. I'm gonna... They're hilarious. They come with one thing and one thing only in mind, to find something wrong. Well, friend, you came, if you want to find something wrong, you came to the right place. Spin Magazine was here. How many are familiar with Spin Magazine? Next time you're in the grocery store, take a look at it and get a shock of your life, man. Spin Magazine is basically a raunch, rock and roll, gutter language. I mean, it is, it's Spin Magazine. For those of you that are a little bit older, you remember the Rolling Stone, it's still out. Well, Spin Magazine is a magazine for today. It's a thick magazine, it comes out every month. Spin Magazine was here for three days, they're doing a huge article on the revival. And a man came up to me and he said, I just want to tell you something, Mr. Hill. I've seen some things at your revival that I don't think are God. And I said, well, so have I. He said, you have? <laughs> I said, buddy. There's sometimes we have 6,000 people on this campus. We got witches and warlocks and l Lulu birds that come in here, man. We weirdos. I mean, man, there's a stuff goes on every night that ain't God. He looked at me like, then you know about that stuff? I said, of course I do. But do you think I'm going to spend my life patrolling this and patrolling that and putting out that little fire and putting out that little fire when thousands of people have come to receive from God? And he just sort of backed off. He was going to write all about that, you know, and... He just backed up and went, wow. So you know about that stuff. I said, yeah. So if you've come here tonight and you say, well, I saw some stuff that I don't think was God. Maybe you did. So what? Back off, friend. Relax. We have people that come in to mock the revival. That's why they come is to mock. And you'll look at their behavior the other night, we had a whole group of punk rockers in the back. And somebody, and if I ever found this person, I'd lock them in the penitentiary for life. Somebody went up to the punk rockers. They were all dressed. They had, they had rings in their lips and just leathers and chains. Somebody walked up to them and said, you're a disgrace in the house of God. Get out of this place. It wasn't anybody from Brownsville. Brownsville would never do that. Brownsville Assembly loves everybody. Everybody, I mean, they're just uncanny how much they love people. But some righteous, religious, dead individual 
said that to these kids, and the kids call me up the next day because they know I'm a friend of the punk rockers, a friend of sinners. And he cussed me out. One of them just cussed me up and down over the telephone. I went, whoa, 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 Bubba. Do you know who you're cussing out? So you're cussing out the evangelist. I did not say that to you guys. I said, you know I love you guys, and if you'll come back, that ain't going to happen. If it does, I'll, I'll find that person. I'll bring them in front of everybody. We'll rebuke them in front of everybody. The next night, those punk rockers were all on the front row. <laughs> Come altar call time, every one of them. It's amazing. For every one of them gave their lives to Jesus. Well, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Those of you in this room that you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. This has been a heart-to-heart -to -heart talk tonight. You need Jesus Christ to get the sin out of your life. You know you do. In the chapel, the campus is packed tonight. Every building is packed. In the chapel, in the choir room, the cafeteria. You need Jesus Christ to change your life. I want you to listen to this preacher. Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Every backslider. This, this is what blows my mind, friend, in this revival. We have people come up, and they'll say, I've been in church for 15 years, and then they confess adultery, drug addiction, and alcoholism. Or they'll stand up and they'll say, I've known Jesus for 15 years, and I thank God that he is delivering me now from crack cocaine. I go, you've known Jesus for 15 years and he's delivering you now from crack cocaine. I don't think so, friend. There's not a, you know, it just doesn't work like that. It sounds like you left Jesus a long time ago and took upon yourself crack cocaine because your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. You drove Jesus out and put crack cocaine in. And every night when this altar call is given, people come by the scores with that kind of problem. In church, but backslid. In sin. Doing things that Jesus would never do. If you're here tonight, friend, how many are here tonight? Good. If you're here tonight, and maybe you're out of the church, you knew the Lord 15, 20 years ago, but you've slipped away from God, and now you've lost your spiritual appetite. The sin doesn't bother you anymore. That's a sure sign of a backslidden person. I'm here to tell you that Jesus will forgive you tonight if you'll make a move for him. He'll forgive you, friend. He'll wash you clean. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, you've never known Jesus. He's in this place. Don't ask me to explain how it works. I've never been able to explain it. All I know is you can come down here and chant to Buddha until you're blue and nothing's going to happen. You can come here and bow down to this pulpit. You can take a knife out and carve yourself up, put tattoos all over your body, pull your hair out and scream out to, to the tree god, which people are doing right now all over the place. Visit California, friend. Those of you from California, I love you dearly, but I've witnessed all over that state. And y'all got some strange things going on there. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Strange things. Everybody's born again type of thing, you know. You say, are you born again? Yes. <laughs> Come into my home. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. You come in and their ceiling's got this big, this big tree branch hanging from it and, and, a, and a turtle swinging back and forth. And, and they'll say, three years ago, I met this turtle. And it was an enlightenment. Unlike, do you know how much we're like turtles? Uh, no, I haven't a clue. My whole life has been changed. Friend, you can do stuff like that. Ain't nothing going to happen. You can call the psychics. 
I've shared in this revival that if they really cared about you, it would be 1-800, not 1-900. <laughs> they don't care about you. That's why it's 1-900. They want your money, honey. That's what they're after. Call them all day long. Get a reading. Get tomorrow's reading, the next reading, the next reading. Sooner or later, one of them's going to come to pass, you know. Something silly like next week you will eat. And some of you go, oh, dear God. They'll go, last week you ate or you've had troubles in your life. Did you know people fall for that? My God, how did she know? It'll never change you. You can bow down to this pulpit, it won't change you. Bow down to that speaker, it won't change you. Get in a circle and chant all night long, you'll never change. But when you come here, friend, and you get on your face, and you call out to the one who was crucified on Calvary for you 2,000 years ago, your whole life will change before your very eyes. He'll turn you around. What do you think causes these, these hunks to stand up in this baptismal pool? These men to stand up there big enough to beat half of us up with one whap of their hand. What causes them to stand up and there go, I love Jesus. What is that, friend? He delivered me from this and that and this and that. Friend, there's power. So those of you that have never known the Lord, you're going to come quickly in just a minute down to this place. And those of you that are religious, you need to come down here and meet the Lord. You've met, you've met your denomination. You know your pastor. You know the deacons. I, need, I want you to meet Jesus. A big difference, trust me. There's a big difference. I'm a married man. My wife knows me. We love each other. But thank God she knows Jesus. There's a big difference between me and Jesus. Jesus, she can go to Jesus any time of the day. He's there all the time. He answers prayers. He heals. You need to meet Jesus. You met your pastor. You met the deacons. You met the church members. Now meet Jesus. Meet the Lord. Meet the one, the very reason your denomination was founded years ago. It was founded because people had encounters with the living God. But now many of us have become institutionalized, and that's no longer important. I'm going to give this altar call. Everyone who's away from God, listen in the chapel, the choir room, and the cafeteria. And those of you at home, if you need Jesus to forgive you, you're going to come when Charity sings, run to the mercy seat. If you know you need forgiveness, you know you need the Lord to come into your life, and you don't come, that's called pride, P-R-I-D-E. And it's a damnable characteristic. You need to get it out of your life. It stinks. Pride says, what will my girlfriend think? What will my wife think? What's everybody going to think when I walk forward? Who cares what they think, friend? You didn't come into this world with your buddy, and you're not leaving with your buddy. You're leaving alone, friend. And your buddy is not going to vouch for you on Judgment Day. He's not going to be a stand-in witness for you. You're going to be by yourself on that final day, friend. So you need to come by yourself tonight. I want everyone to stand right now. Everyone stand up. Charity, get the microphone. Everyone in this place that needs forgiveness, everyone in this place who's backslidden, everyone in this place who is away from Jesus, you need the Lord to save you, forgive you. I want you to come quickly right now. Quickly right now. Come on. Come on. In the balcony, let's go. Come on right now. Let's go. Hurry. 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 God bless y'all. God bless y'all. Hurry. Come on. Come on, in the balcony, come on. In the chapel, let's go. Come on, sing it, Charity. I face the power. Come on, God bless you. Come on, come on, come on. In the balcony, let's go. Come on, come on. Let them through, folks, let them through. Let them through. Come on. Let's go. In the chapel, let's go. Come on. Come on. In the 
chapel, let's go. In the choir room, let's go. Cafeteria, let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's go. God bless you, sis. God bless you, ma'am. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you, sir. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. No one else looking around at the altar, stay right where you're at. Keep your heads down. I'm telling you, friend, you had better come. You had better come. Let's hold off. Let's hold off just a minute. Come on. People praying for you, friend. There's people praying for you. Come on. Come on. God bless you, sis. God bless you, son. God bless you, sir. Hurry. God bless you, son. God bless you, son. God bless you, sis. Hurry! What are you waiting on? What in this world is more important than Jesus? Shake the pornography. Shake the lust. Shake the bitterness. Shake the anger. Get down here right now, friend. For God's sake, shake, shake the pride tonight. Get the pride out. Get the pride out and get down here. In the balcony, let's go. In the choir room, let's go. Cafeteria, chapel. Richard, there's more in that chapel. God bless you, sir. Help him down. God bless you, sis. Get on your face. I want everyone in this sanctuary to turn to the person next to them and ask them this question. Are you supposed to be down there? Ask them that question right now and then bring them down here with you. Then bring them down here with you right now. Are you supposed to be down there? Come on. Come on. God bless you, sis. Yeah, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Woo. Come on down from the balcony. We're going to wait on you. We're going to wait on you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Father, I pray in the chapel that not one person would slip out of there without getting right with you. In the cafeteria, not one soul, Holy Spirit, would slip out of there without getting in touch with you, Jesus. In the choir room, not one soul. In the other overflow rooms, not one soul would leave out without getting in touch with you, Holy Spirit. Come on. Linda, let's sing this one time through. They're still coming. I don't know why this is trickling in at the very end. I'm watching 50 people come forward right now. What on earth are you waiting for? You've got 60 seconds. If you're coming, come now. Come now. Come on. Hurry.
the altar, keep your heads down. Friends, we added another 100 people. But I'm telling you right now, we're going to close this altar call. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads down, your eyes closed. God's working in your life. But I read an article the other day of a lady that got upset because the preacher was so intense with this part of the service. She got upset. She didn't like this part where she had, people had to come forward. Friend, let me tell you something. There's coming an event in man's history that is going to startle the world. It's called the rapture. And when the rapture takes place, there's not going to be a 60-second warning. God's not going to pull out a watch and say, you've got 60 seconds to get right. You would give anything for 60 seconds on that day. Anything. You'll remember these services, and you'd say, dear God, pull out your watch. Give me 60 seconds. I'm running. So you need to thank God right now that he's given you time. He's given you a space to repent. There's still a couple people struggling, and I'm going to close this in 30 seconds. The Lord has opened up that door one more time. Charity, I want you to sing through Amazing Grace a cappella one time. You can come right now, sir. Ma'am, come on. Amazing Grace, how sweet Hurry. the sound Hurry. that Hurry. saved Hurry. a wretch. God bless you. God bless you. I once was lost. God bless you. But now Holy Ghost. I'm found. Was blind. Anybody else? But Anybody now else? I see. I can hear it, friend. There's people still coming. Come on. One more time, Charity. Amazing come on, God bless you, sis. Come on. Come on. Come on. How sweet come on. The People are still coming. Come on. That save a wretch like me. Oh, Lord. I, I was, was lost. I was lost. But now, but now I'm found. found. Was blind, but now I see. Everyone at this altar, bow your heads. Everyone at the altar, bow your heads. Close your eyes right now. Those of you in the overflow rooms, bow your head. Close your eyes. At home, bow your head. Close your eyes. Pray this prayer with me right now, friend. And please, I beg of you, do not mumble. Do not mumble this prayer. Pray it out loud. It'll do you good to pray out loud right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for speaking to my heart. To my heart. Thank, you, Holy Spirit, thank you, Holy Spirit, for not leaving me alone. Leaving me alone. Thank you, Father, thank you, Father for, sending your only son, for sending your only Son that I might have life. Have life. Thank you, Jesus for shedding your blood. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to me about the sin in my life. I ask you tonight, Jesus, to forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Wash my sins away. Make me new. Brand new, Jesus. Your word says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new person. All things pass away, and all things become new. Thank you, Jesus, that you're washing my sins away. You're restoring the years that the locusts have eaten. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, Jesus, I am yours, and you are mine. I give myself 100% to you.
come live your life through me. In Jesus' name. Say it one more time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.